In the last video, we defined generator networks. We saw that they represent a very rich family of probability distributions. We also saw that training them can be a tricky business. In this video, we'll look at one approach, the method of generative adversarial networks. GANs originated just after convolutional neural networks were breaking new grounds, showing spectacular, sometimes superhuman performance in image labeling. The suggestion arose that to some extent convolutional neural networks might be doing the same as what humans do when they look at something. To verify this, researchers decided to start investigating what kind of inputs would make a trained confnet give a certain output. This is easy to do. You just compute the gradient with respect to the input of the network and train the input to maximize the activation of a particular label. So in this case, we take the activation of the node corresponding to the class bus as the value that we want to maximize, we keep the weights of the network fixed, and we optimize the input. You would expect that even if you start with a random image, if you follow the gradient to maximize the activation of the output node corresponding to the bus label, you'd get a picture of a bus, or at least something that looks a little bit like a bus. What you actually get is something, is something that to us is indistinguishable from the noise you started with. Only the very tiniest of changes is required to make the network see a bus. These are called adversarial examples, instances that are specifically crafted to trip up a given model. The researchers also found that if they started the search not at a random image, but at an image of another class, all that was needed to change the class that the neural network saw was a very small distortion. So small, that to us, the image looks unchanged. In short, a tiny bit of distortion is enough to make a CNN think that a picture of a bus is a picture of an ostrich. Adversarial examples are an active area of research, both into how to generate them and into how to make models more robust against them. Even manipulating objects in the physical world can have this effect. A stop sign can be made to look like a different traffic sign by the simple addition of some stickers. Pretty soon, this bad news was turned into good news by realizing that if you can generate adversarial examples automatically, you can also add them to the dataset as negatives and retrain your neural network to make it more robust. Here's what that looks like for a binary classifier, let's say one that is trained to tell buses from non-buses. We start by training a basic classifier as we normally would. We generate some adversarial examples, examples that are clearly not the positive class but that are classified as such by the classifier. And we add these adversarial examples to the negative class in our dataset, and we retrain our classifier. The classifier, also known as the discriminator, gets more robust, and the process that we use to generate images generates more and more realistic images. We can think of this as a kind of iterated two-player game, or an arms race. The generator tries to get good enough to fool the classifier, and the classifier tries to get good enough to tell the fake from the true images. And that's the basic idea of generative adversarial networks. We'll look at four different examples of GANs. We'll call the basic approach the vanilla GAN, and that's where we'll start. Generating adversarial examples by gradient descent is possible, but it's much nicer if both our generator and our discriminator are separate neural networks. This will lead to a much cleaner approach for training GANs. We'll draw the two components like this. The generator takes an input sampled from a standard multivariate normal and produces an image. This is a generator network like we described in the previous video. And the discriminator takes an image and classifies it as positive, a real image, or negative, a fake image sampled from the generator. If we have other images that don't belong to the target class, we can add those to the negative examples as well. But often the positive class is just a set of images sampled from a distribution, like a collection of images of human faces. And the negative class consists only of the fake images created by the generator. To train the discriminator, we feed it examples from the positive class and train it to classify these as positive. We also sample images from the generator, whose weights we keep fixed, and train the discriminator to classify these as negative. At first, these will just be random noise, but there's little harm in telling our network that such images are not buses, or whatever our positive class is. Note that since the generator is a neural network, we don't need to first collect a data set of fake images, 
we can just stick the discriminator on top of the generator, feed it some normally distributed noise, and train it by backpropagation to classify the result as negative. We just need to make sure to freeze the weights of the generator. Then, to train the generator, we freeze the discriminator and train the weights of the generator to produce images that cause the discriminator to label them as positive. And these are the two steps of our two-player game. We don't need to wait for either step to converge. We can just train the discriminator for one batch, that is one step of gradient descent, and then train the generator for one batch and so on. This approach is what we call the vanilla GAN. Sometimes we want to train the network to take an input, but to generate the output probabilistically. For instance, when we train a neural network to color in a black and white photograph of a butterfly, it could choose many colors for the butterfly. And we want to avoid mode collapse here. Instead of averaging over all possible colors, giving us a brown or gray butterfly, we want it to pick one color and paint the butterfly vividly and brightly in that color. A conditional GAN lets us train generator networks that can do this. All we need is a data set of paired up images where we have an input and an example of what kind of output should result. And in most of these examples, the job is to reverse an operation that is easy to do the other way around. For instance, with a simple edge detection algorithm, we can easily turn a photograph of a handbag into a line drawing of that handbag, but reversing the operation is difficult. And this is why the data for these kinds of tasks is easy to generate. In a conditional GAN, the generator is a function with an image input, which it maps to an image output. However, it uses randomness to help it imagine specific details in the output, and this randomness is part of its input. Running this generator twice, but with a newly sampled random vector z, would result in a different shoe that is also a correct instantiation of the input line drawing. The discriminator of the conditional GAN takes a pair of an input and an output. If these come from the generator, they should be classified as fake, i.e. negative, and if they come from the data, they should be classified as real or positive. The generator is then trained in two ways. As with the vanilla GAN, we freeze the weights of the discriminator and train the generator to produce things that the discriminator thinks are real, but we can also feed in an input from the data and backpropagate on the corresponding output, and it was found that L1 loss works best in this case. The conditional GAN works really well, but only if we have examples of a specific output for the input. For some tasks, we have an idea that transformations from one domain to another domain are possible, but we don't have paired up images. We only have a large set of images in one domain and a large set of images in the other domain. If we randomly match an image in one domain to another domain, we get mode collapse again, so that doesn't work. The cycle GAN solves this problem by adding a cycle consistency term to the loss function. The idea is that we train two generators, one to map from domain A to domain B, and one to map from domain B to domain A. In this case, we have a horse to zebra generator and a zebra to horse generator. And each of these generators comes with its own discriminator. The idea of the cycle consistency loss term is that if we transform a picture from a horse to a zebra and back again, the result should be close to the original image. So the objective becomes to train a horse to zebra transformation and a zebra to horse transformation together in such a way that the horse discriminator can tell the generated horses from real ones, and the zebra discriminator can't tell the generated zebras from real ones, and the cycle consistency loss for both of them combined is low. Here's how it was drawn in the paper. On the left, we see a generator G mapping from domain X to domain Y, and then back again to domain X, and the cycle consistency tells us that the input of this process should be close to the output, and on the right we see the same for a mapping from domain Y to domain X. One way to understand the cycle again is to think of the generators as practicing steganography. That's the business of hiding a secret message in plain sight. The task of the horse to zebra generator is to hide a picture of a horse inside a picture of a zebra in such a way that the discriminator cannot tell that something's been hidden inside the picture and that the original horse picture can be decoded from the zebra picture. The cycle again works surprisingly well. Here's how it maps photographs to impressionist paintings and vice versa. It doesn't always work perfectly though, and there are some interesting failure cases. Finally, 
Let's take a look at the style gap, the network that generated the faces we first saw in the introduction. This is basically a vanilla GAN, and most of the special tricks it uses are in the way the generator is constructed. It uses too many tricks to discuss here in detail, so we'll just focus on one aspect. The idea that the latent vector is fed to the network, not just at the input, but at every stage of its forward pass. Note that an image generator starts with a low-resolution, high-level description of an image, and slowly fills in the details as it upsamples the image layer by layer. The idea of the style gam is that every stage of this process, we feed in the latent vector, suitably transformed so that it matches the dimensions of the image at that stage. This allows it to use different parts of the latent vector to describe different aspects of the image. The authors call these styles. On the right, the network receives separate extra random noise per layer that allows it to make random choices. Without this source of randomness, all the randomness in the output would have to come from the latent vector. To see how this works, we can try to manipulate the network by changing the latent vector from one to another for some of the layers. In this example, all images on these margins here are people that are generated from a particular single latent vector. We can then regenerate the image for the destination vertically, except that for a few layers at the bottom, middle or top of the network, we use the source latent vector instead. As we see, Overriding the bottom layer changes things like gender, age, and hair length, but not ethnicity. For the middle layer, the age is largely taken from the destination image, but the ethnicity is now overridden by the source. And finally, for the top layer, only surface details are taken from the source, and most of the basic properties of the face are taken from the destination. This kind of manipulation was done during training as well to ensure that it would lead to faces that fool the discriminator. Let's look at the other side of the network, the noise inputs. What we do here is we keep all the latent and noise inputs the same, except for the very last noise input, and we generate four different images where this input vector is resampled. And we can see now what the noise achieves. The man stays the same, and his hair is equally messy in each generated example, but exactly in what way it's messy changes per sample. In order to generate this image, the network needs to determine the precise orientation of each individual hair that is visible, and this requires a lot of randomness. And this requires a lot of randomness, which the latent vector cannot provide just by itself. We've given you a high-level overview of GANs, which will hopefully give you an intuitive grasp of how they work. However, GANs are notoriously difficult to train, and many other tricks are required to get them to work. Here are some phrases you should Google if you decide to try implementing your own GAN. In the next video, we'll look at a completely different approach to training generator networks, the method of autoencoders.